So uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about um, SQL optimization and Python optimization that exists within data pipelines, specifically to data science, but I think that it's pretty applicable across software engineering and data science. As you said, my name is Jordan Hagen. I'm a senior data scientist with Minor and Kosh. We're a full-time consultancy, so I work with a bunch of uh, other data scientists with an array of backgrounds from PhDs to people like myself that just have a bachelor's but have uh, a near decade of data experience. I started out my career in 2010 as a data analyst working with a government subcontractor subcontractor to predict uh, Medicare Part D fraud, and I've loved it ever since. I've been in various roles, different DBA roles, analyst roles, data engineering type roles, and I've seen a lot of it, and that's what kind of brought me to bring this talk here today. Additionally, there's my cute little daughter. Um, she's seven months old, and we have some cats at home, and, and I really enjoy them too, so that's good. So why I'm giving this talk. When I got into data science about uh, three years ago now, I realized that things like Kaggle competitions and data science tutorials out there provide you with like a really clean CSV that you just go ahead and you nicely load into your Pandas data frame and you're like, cool, did it, data, you know? <laughs> like, and it's, it's tedious because like as, when I got into it, I was like, that's not how data is. I know because I've been doing this for a long time prior to data, data science. And as I have underlined here, data lives in databases. Like there aren't companies out there with massive like inventories of CSV files that you like harvest through. And so I thought it was really silly that a lot of these data science tutorials um, and even like software engineering type tutorials don't focus on SQL when it's such like a critical backbone of like literally everything we do. So uh, SQL's been around for 50 years and in tech that's a really long time when things literally change month to month. And it's been around so long because it's really good at what it was built to do. And so knowing and how to leverage that power I think is incredibly valuable. Python then provides a platform to do more advanced data manipulation and parallel processing. And like I said, knowing what tool to use when uh, leads to just an overall increase in productivity and optimization. So my objectives here, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna review some SQL best practices. We're gonna go through some data manipulation and feature engineering that you can do before you ever bring that data into Pandas. And then I'm gonna also talk about probably the biggest pain point of dealing with SQL and any software programming language is reading and writing to and from SQL. So uh, this is a diagram to kind of give you context as I go through this talk. Everything in my current production data pipelines is written in Python. Even the SQL is called by a uh, ORM library, whichever one, I'm not gonna advocate for one, I think I tend to use SQL Alchemy, um, but I think they're all probably fine. Um, but everything exists within a Python atmosphere, and then I use various SQL calls to go ahead, limit my data down, get it to where I really want it, and then go ahead and straight load that into Pandas for either loading into my machine learning algorithm or various other data manipulation I'd wanna do. So some SQL best practices before we even get started. I firmly believe that if you get, take nothing else away from this talk, um, this slide is, is probably the most important. Um, your from statement literally dictates how you write the rest of your code. It is the first thing you should be thinking of before you even write your selects, before you grab your columns, just how do you wanna then join all your other tables? How do you wanna throw your where statements in there? That from statement is, is crux to literally the rest of your SQL code. Um, you want it to kind of be a core table. And when I say core table, I mean, think of things that are, are really highly indexed and primary keyed within your database. Users is the example I use here. There's probably a users table literally in every database. It has a lot of great keys that you're gonna be linking to other things. It's really indexed. It's probably concise, nice and easy to kind of pivot off of there. Um, I have an example here, two queries. They return the exact same results. It is grabbing all users that have theoretically had an order within the last 30 days. The only thing different about these queries is I flip the tables. So what was, is the from table in one is my inner join in another one. And it literally makes a six second difference. So just stepping back, putting a little patience into your architecture here and understanding of how you wanna write that rest of that query, uh, compounded out over millions and millions of rows, six seconds can make a huge difference. So um, 
Also advocating for why temp tables rock. When I was a, a fledgling data analyst, I wrote like 300 line SQL queries and I was so proud of them. I was like super, super pumped. I, I thought it was hot shit. I was like, they're like nested, they're impossible to read, I did terrible aliases and I was like, this is perfect, job security. You know, like, this is, this is not, no, this is very bad. Um, when I got more into the programming side, when I went into data science and learned Python, I learned about single responsibility and how you should write things in a really meaningful way where they have one goal and one outcome that you're really kind of aiming for there. And so I started taking what I used to put into subselects in my SQL query and going ahead and bringing them out into temp tables that you then just regular inner join when you write your like final SQL poll there. Um, one, it's way easier to troubleshoot. Like you can see, is it happening here in this temp table here or here where trying to like troubleshoot nested SQL queries is a bit of a nightmare. Um, also, uh, if you don't know about SQL, there's a thing called a query optimizer that runs. Uh, it's incredibly unpredictable. Trying to figure out how SQL code runs is nearly impossible. There's some code out there like SQL Server where you can actually like visualize it out and see. Um, still, it's a little bit hard to diagnose, but knowing that it's there and that it's working to find the most efficient way to run your code is kind of what's important. And the query optimizer works way better on temp tables than it does on subselects. Subselects kind of break it and it can't quite figure out how to optimize things, where in temp tables it's like, cool, I optimized over here, and I optimized over here, and now I'm bringing them together, and it's nice and easy. Um, some just additional things that I'm gonna call out here that didn't deserve their own slide. Um, when you're doing wildcard searches, if you can, go ahead and just limit it to a backend wildcard search. That way it's not searching the entire string. I think that probably actually applies to Python too. Um, additionally, functions on index columns in the where clause remove indexing. Uh, that's a bit of a, a tongue twister, so I provided an example here. So substring is a function. These two things return, the, again, the exact same results. Substring will remove my indexing from whatever column I'm calling it on, and it will make my query run shorter versus uh, a like syntax. It will actually run much faster. So again, just thinking about how you want to go ahead and structure it, get the same results just faster. Uh, don't pull in columns you don't need. Uh, that applies to all software engineering and all data science ever. Uh, more columns is more data. More data is slower. So if you can like really streamline what you're pulling in, it's just gonna be faster. Uh, move filters from the where statement in the join condition uh, to the join condition if you're using an outer join. So an outer join, you're grabbing everything that's in your from table and then everything that's in your outer join table. Uh, it will go ahead and grab everything and then apply your where condition. Whereas if you go ahead and move that to an and statement in your join, it will apply that filter before the where condition and not pull in unnecessary data. So just one of those things to keep in mind, that's a nice little easy win. Um, use your indices as much as possible. That's what it's there for. They help uh, the query optimizer, like I was saying, really figure out the fastest way to go ahead and do that. Uh, and last but not least, if you can use union all versus union distinct, it is faster. Um, also, ANSI SQL, when you just write union, defaults to union distinct. And so you might not even be realizing that you're purposely causing your queries to take longer because uh, you didn't explicitly call it out, but it, it's going through and it's trying to make sure there's no duplicates in it, which will take longer. So if you don't care about duplicates or if you've already deep duped when you're going ahead and combining these tables, just make sure you, you add that all, especially if it, you're just using union. So some data manipulation before we ever get into Python and Pandas here. Joining multiple data sources. This is what SQL was made to do. This is why it's been around for 50 years. This is what it is good at. Um, you're gonna have a massive, large relational database, especially if you've ever worked in a pretty like substantially sized company. I used to work in healthcare. Those databases are insanity. <laughs> healthcare has so much data. And so um, linking across tables, like it would be very silly to bring in like users and orders into two separate pandas data frames and then do your joining, right? Like we're gonna wanna do our joining long before we ever get it into pandas. I would even go so far as to advocate for standing up a quick database if it's gonna be CSVs that you're accessing multiple times. So say you do have a raw CSV and you're not working with a database, but you're going to be accessing these CSVs on a regular basis. Go ahead, pick a, 
pick a SQL that you like. I prefer Postgres, but really any of them are fine. Uh, just go ahead, spin it up a quick database really quick and throw your CSVs in there. That way you're not having to reload it into memory every time. You can just quickly go ahead and join those tables, create a final condensed table that you want, and then pull that into memory. Um, also, what you should do before you ever load it in memory, like I was saying, is go ahead and narrow down that data set. Loading five million rows straight into memory and then applying filters and pandas would be incredibly time consuming and inefficient and not the best use of any kind of pipeline. But even if you're not doing a pipeline, if you're just doing exploratory data analysis or anything like that, really bringing it down to what you need to load in the memory and then applying what we learned earlier with Andrew's stuff as to how to make pandas a little more memory efficient um, will save you a lot of headache. Also, uh, on the data science side of things, time frame considerations. Go ahead, train your model on one year of data, uh, and then train it on two years and see if you see a dramatic improvement. If you don't, don't pull in two years of data. It is unnecessary. Um, so again, this talk is kind of geared towards data science, so if you don't completely understand uh, bias and variance, don't worry about it. These graphs kind of give you a general point. But in machine learning, there is uh, something you have to consider, this variance bias trade-off, and what that really will help us determine is how many records we can go ahead and load here. So uh, I nicely stole these from a Coursera course by Andrew Yang, <laughs> but they're nice and they get the point across. So in a high variance case for our learning curves here versus our test and train set, um, you can kind of see that if we were to extrapolate this out farther, our training set size, eventually those lines would converge and we would agree on an error. Um, so more data in this case would help us. So you might want to go back and grab that two years of data we were talking about. Whereas if you have high bias, we're going to converge those test and train sets pretty quickly on a high error, which has its own problem. So it's just good for diagnosing that as well. But more training data will not solve your problem here. So again, it's just kind of a nice way to figure out, all right, how much data do I actually need to go ahead and make this machine learning algorithm work? On my next slide here, I have a, what I'm calling a good, good learning curve. We don't have bias or variance. We kind of converge quickly and at a low error. And here I'm advocating, so if you're setting up an entire pipeline that's going ahead and retraining and updating your model on new data as it becomes available, Maybe you don't need a massive training set like you did that first time. You can go ahead, plot out a learning curve and see, okay, wherever this line was where we converged, that's actually all the data I need. I don't need to pull in everything else. I'm not getting any benefit from that. If anything, it's, it's hurting my time to retrain that model. So just some, I, th I think learning curves in data science are, are multifaceted beneficial, and so I, I advocate for them pretty, pretty heavily. Um, you can also do a lot of feature engineering in SQL. I would say because it's a language I'm more comfortable with over Python, I tend to do more feature engineering than less in SQL. But here I called out a few instances in where I think it's better. A lot of it, as the last bullet point will say, is kind of up to you at that point in time what language you're most comfortable in. Um, but specifically with things like Git dummies, um, you can run into some issues. So for those who do not know what git dummies or one-hot encoding does in sklearn, it goes ahead and takes a categorical value and pivots that out to um, multiple binary columns. But if you have, so when you bring in and you do a training thing uh, to train the algorithm, you have to do that same data manipulation to your test set so that it goes through those same pipelines. But if you went ahead and trained and you had five categorical values that you one-hot encoded, you're gonna end up with four columns and that'll be good and you'll train your model. But say you go through your t test set, you one-hot encode those or get dummy those, and you only have four examples of those five categorical values, it's only gonna make three columns. And so when you go to go and train or run your test set through your trained model, you'll get a size mismatch. It's kind of annoying in that way in that it's dynamic, it's supposed to be helpful, but um, if you run into a categorical value where all categories aren't represented equally and one of them is kind of a minority, uh, you might run into this issue where you end up with size mismatch. Where case statements nicely have else statements in them, right? So you write your case in SQL, case if this, then this, else, zero. And then every time that data runs through that, you're always guaranteed the exact same size of data for training your data set. Uh, lead and lag and rank functions are available in pandas. I think it's called shift and rank. Um, but 
kind of circling back, lead and rank in SQL uses those indices that we were talking about to go ahead and optimize those, uh, where we do not see that same performance improvement for the similar function in pandas. So if you're gonna do something like lead, leg, lead, leg and rank, I advocate for doing that in SQL over pandas. And then most other feature engineering, it's kind of up to you as to what you think is better or what works for you or what you're most comfortable in. Uh, a shout out to pandas. I'm not forgetting this is a Python convention here. <laughs> I wasn't coming to talk all about SQL, I promise. Um, pandas is really, really awesome as we've seen from a few of the other talks today. It's super powerful. You have an entire like Python ecosystem at your hands. A lot of them, because pandas is so ubiquitous, is made to nicely work with pandas. Uh, the biggest, biggest point on this too for pandas is it's testable. Uh, SQL is not testable. Uh, I think I've seen a few companies try, you can probably get to like some like loose tests, but not in the same way you would have unit tests nicely written in Python. Um, so that might be a reason that you do do a lot of your feature engineering in pandas, is to go ahead and make sure that when you're doing that data manipulation, you have tests written for it, and you're validating that as you're going through. And then easy integration with data visualization libraries, functions like DF describe um, are pretty cornerstone for any EDA you're gonna do. Um, so not to, not to give pandas a hard time, there's a lot of, lot of benefit to pandas. I think just knowing what tool to use when is beneficial. So optimizing reading and writing, because this is my biggest pain point with advocating for SQL. Uh, pandas read SQL and read Google BigQuery are notoriously slow, especially read Google BigQuery. There's actually, I think recently, uh, while I was writing this, um, Google came out with its own library to go ahead and read it, data into data frames from Google BigQuery, so I would actually bypass this completely and never recommend you use that function. Um, but overall, the best way I've found seems a little odd because you add a step in the middle, but you go ahead and once you kind of have your final trimmed down data set that we were talking about in SQL, you save that to a temp table or a, temp ta or a table and you go ahead and you export that to a compressed CSV. Now it seems silly to throw a step in between SQL and pandas when you can just read straight in, but SQL is optimized to write out to CSV really easy, and pandas is optimized to read in CSVs really easy. So it seems weird to purposely put a step in between, but it genuinely runs much faster. So it's kind of annoying, um, but I, I gave, a similar talk to this at a Pi Data conference, and a few uh, senior software engineers came up to me and were like, yes, that is the way we do it too, so until we as a community find a slightly better way to do this, adding that extra step actually makes it faster. Writing, there is. There is an option we don't have to write to CSVs here. Uh, there are batch, batch writing options. Uh, in SQL Alchemy here, I provide an example, and then also the same uh, similar example in Spark of updating our JDBC URL to go ahead and enable batch writing. I had a, um, a recommender that was running in, in Spark and was writing out to a MySQL database and it was taking hours. And I was like, man, I don't know what's taking so long on this. And I was like trying to like section it down and it wasn't the like actual machine learning computation because as we all know from Spark, that's like spread over like 15 worker nodes and I made some beefy clusters and that was running just fine. Uh, it was the write that was taking so long, literally hours. And then all I did was put in this rewrite batch statements equals true, and it brought it down to like 15 minutes. It was outrageous. So if you are ever operating in Spark and writing out to SQL, copy paste this in every single code you have ever written, and it will just be faster. <laughs> Um, so I talk really fast, but I also wanted to give time for questions because I think that's um, kind of this best atmosphere here. I wanted to give you guys some kind of highlights here of like SQL super powerful, pandas is very, very powerful, Python's powerful, and I just think knowing what tool to use when is incredibly powerful. So um, I'm actually gonna go ahead and open up the floor to questions right now, and uh, you guys are free. I think they put a microphone conveniently located in the middle of the floor there. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, if not, uh, I will not pressure you. Um, is there like a, a maximum data set size that you've found beyond which you would generally recommend people try and do a bunch of work in SQL versus in pandas? Oh, like what you would, go ahead. That's a good question. Um, no, I don't think so. I think that's very subjective. 
uh, kind of like what um, Andrew's talk was talking about earlier. I think it depends on the actual types of data you're dealing with. So if you have a lot of like string or objects type stuff, going ahead and like trying to limit that down in the fashion would be beneficial before you get it into pandas or go ahead and doing that data manipulation that he was advocating for in pandas to go ahead and save that memory space. Um, so I think it depends, yeah, a lot on how many columns versus, I can't give a row size because like I was saying, columns also take up a lot of space. And so like saying, like if you have 100 columns versus five columns, it's gonna be very different when loading it into memory. Um, so it's hard to give like a row limit on that. So I think it's very subjective. I think there's a lot to be said about intuition around these kind of things. So you as a, as a programmer, I think, could, could follow a lot of your gut there and, and see like, oh, uh, I'll just bring in a small sample here, see how the like MVP pipeline runs with just a like, 100 sample type thing, get some terrible test learning, like test scores out of that, and then go ahead and iterate from there and just see as I start ramping up that data side where my pipeline starts to break apart a little bit. Uh, in regards to the data cleaning, can you speak as to what you prefer to do with uh, dirty data with a lot of NANs, do you tend to drop them or how oh. would you fill them? Again, I think that's, that's incredibly subjective too, but I like it. I think it depends on the columns the NANs are in. So if you think it's gonna be like a, a pretty highly predictive column or has shown like if you like, um, so say you drop all the rows with NANs in it, you don't leave it, and then you go ahead and you do like a random forest type thing and you get a feature importance out of that, and then that column that had a lot of NANs turned out to be really, really like predictive, I would, maybe probably advocate for going back and trying some machine learning ways to go ahead and fill those NANs in, in a more like informed way versus like just filling them with an average or something like that. Um, but it's also possible that they're the completely useless columns that don't have any predictive power and then I would just drop them because I wouldn't waste time on them. And so, yeah, again, subjective. <laughs> Follow your intuition on that one, but kind of, I, I, I guess I, as a starting point, would advocate for either just filling them all with zeros or dropping them completely and just training a, a MVP model on data you do have and see which columns tend to, tend to pull out as that most important. I really like, this is kind of a side note, I tend to put in when I'm training a model uh, a random column. So it's just a column that I just fill with random numbers. And then when I do something like random forest or something I can get feature importance out of, um, I go ahead and I see everything that's above random and I keep it and everything that's below random I drop because it was no better than random. <laughs> and so I, I, I really like that. And so I think like starting with that, throwing in a random column, dropping anything that doesn't have viable data in it and then using that as a benchmark for go ahead and filling those out more. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much.